Andreas, good morning, everyone. Um, so this is a talk that I think when they were putting the agenda together is a look into the future. But even now, when we look at this extensive list and great talks this morning, it's pretty confusing. And, and where does it leave us in our general practice? What are we supposed to do? Like, what should we really choose? And, and I think we'll see today as we line up a panel, maybe we can't agree all the time because it's a very controversial area. So this was this getting out the crystal ball and to really look at the trends that are happening within the world, um, also with science, to see, well, where where is this going to go, and how can we gear our practices and hedge to be prepared uh, for the future? One of the things that tends to be a, a general trend is migrating away from techniques that injure the subchondral, subchondral bone. There's many reasons for that. One, of, one is the long-term outcomes of this, but even more importantly is what it does to the bone itself. So plenty of reports of subchondral hypertrophy. This is this inner lesional osteophyte. Subchondral cysts have been associated with any of these techniques that traverse the subchondral bone. So a brand new respect for the subchondral bone is certainly, I think, coming uh, first and foremost. The second is really, as Andreas was saying, is treating subchondral bone lesions themselves. And we spend a lot of time in cartilage and talking about the techniques, but we spend very little time talking about the foundation. Yet our colleagues in medicine, especially the rheumatologists, have told us for years that the most painful part of our cartilage lesion is the bone directly underneath it. And there's plenty of good literature to support it, including if you have a bone marrow lesion, it's the strongest predictor of the presence of pain in that joint with, with a chondral defect or osteoarthritis. And in a osteoarthritis, nine times more likely to progress to total knee replacement. So kind of the writing's on the wall. It even gets worse because then if, we're want, if we want to use the cells immediately below in that area of subchondral edema, they're probably not there in the quantities as they typically are. There's been perfusion defects noted, so there's less blood flow. Overall, probably less cells available for us to use. And although this is controversial, but there is a certain trend in the literature that any cartilage technique that you do, if you do it with bone marrow edema below it, then it trends to be a little bit worse on your outcomes. So just, again, all riding on the wall to treat the bone. Here's a case example, 34-year-old, and you can see with the arrows, this is a chondral defect, but it's also much more. There's the subchondral cysts, the subchondral edema there. So the question is really, will that do okay if we just replace the cartilage? There's lots of choices uh, that we can use in, in modern day. Uh, one is just get rid of that cystic bone using the osteochondral allograft, as uh, we uh, just uh, talked about many uh, this morning. Um, but there's some other ways to do it. If you felt that that was not appropriate, and these are evolving techniques. The first is the biologic stimulation technique, and this, this requires a fluoro-guided placement of wire, but it's through the longest route. It must go through normal bone to get to the abnormal bone, but it's certainly not the, the shortest trajectory. That will drag then the bleeding and the cells from the normal area, hopefully into the abnormal area. If you have room and desire, you can overream this wire with a four millimeter reamer. It creates a little bit more destruction in the area, which is good, right? We're trying to stimulate that area to heal, and the same time, more room for the biologics if you would like to use it. Bone marrow aspirate concentrate is probably ideally poised for this. Why? Because it's bone marrow. Uh, putting it back into the bone marrow seems reasonable from the biologic perspective, and maybe after it's concentrated uh, as well. The way we've been doing this is taking out the wire, leaving in the reamer, and this injecting this BMAC that has been activated with calcium or thrombin, <clears throat> excuse me, calcium or thrombin right through the drill bit. And it's a great conduit to get way down deep into the site uh, that you would like. As far as the structural side of things, this is the so-called subchondroplasty, and although maybe not appropriate for our just chondral defect patients who are young and active, it's more of thinking and getting the gears going in our minds about the subchondral bone and maybe some of those patients without the lesion on top. Um, this requires placement of a, uh, again, a, a, a needle 
gem sheety like needle right below the area, uh, right in the area of the subchondral uh, edema, injecting a special kind of cement, and then doing the arthroscopy. And that was a hard learn, uh, learning lesson, I think, at least for me, is that always do this subchondroplasty part first and the arthroscopy second, uh, because many times you can see that these subchondral uh, uh, fractures, you can see the bone cement coming out uh, and through there, as you see on this lesion here, and into the joint. So that's an unhappy patient if you leave them without washing out the calcium phosphate cement. Injecting slowly because this is a pressurized environment within the bone marrow, so we don't want to overpressurize it because that also can cause postoperative pain. And certainly placing the needle near the lesion is really important, and that there has been many failures that have been uh, brought forward because of putting the needle too far away from the subchondral bone. Uh, the next trend is developing arthroscopic techniques for the type of cartilage transplant or technique that you would like to do. And they have a lot in common, and it's not so bad, but it just takes a little setup and a little practice. What they all have in common is preparing the subchondral bone, and not by putting holes through it, by removing the calcified cartilage. It's that same microfracture technique without the microfracture, and so just taking the curette and removing the calcified cartilage layer, and then most of these techniques involve layers of fiber and glue. And so then you can add whatever type of biologic that you would like there, and then you can add another area, uh, area of fiber and glue. Here's what it looks like. So this requires a cannula to keep the soft tissues away from your site that you're treating. Uh, this requires suction to be uh, hooked up to the scope portal as well as to the working portal. This is then drying the lesion as much as we can. The calcified cartilage layer has already been removed. Uh, file, finally, the biologic, so here's juvenile chondrocyte. It's just an example uh, of this. And what we see, and Nick uh, really attested to this, that these, these biologics and matrices float on the fiber and glue. So it really takes a lot of work to really mash them in and get them to the level of the joint. So you see this is gonna take a little time to really get this uh, flush with the surrounding uh, cartilage. Uh, but when it does, then you see it's everything's below, it's no longer floating, and then putting another layer of fiber and glue. So we've been following these cases very closely, and we have not had the dissociation. Um, and so I think it's because of this part of really mashing those in there. There's already arthroscopic techniques described for many of these techniques, so uh, just having a little bit of uh, fun and trying them uh, may be uh, reasonable. Maybe a migration towards cellular therapy. We're talking about that the microfracture and the microdrilling may be uh, trending away, but maybe the cells, as more and more uh, data comes in, uh, may be the future of, of this whole cartilage thing, and the question is why. And one thing we've learned a long time ago now is a really old paper, but it's still the truth about chondrocytes is that chondrocytes are more adult cells, so they have more trouble attaching to the subchondral bone and the surrounding cartilage. And so maybe the cells, and that's the early um, experience, can do a little bit better um, to attaching to the surrounding areas. Learning bone marrow aspiration techniques, that could be one uh, technique that uh, can be done. Um, and just getting practice with that along with understanding that the aspiration volume really has to be low. So one to four cc's at each site. Learning fat harvest, uh, a good time for that. It can be done arthroscopically. And so easy techniques published in the literature uh, to really begin the process of, of working with the cells. Um, if you want, when your patient's asleep, even practice the abdominal harvest. I know it's very foreign for us, but it's easy technique to do. And, uh, and it's all over YouTube and, uh, and the literature. Fractionating fat, there's multiple ways to do it, but this needs to be done uh, with these techniques. That involves uh, the syringes here or lipogems, and those are both mechanisms to fractionate the fat to be able to use it. Same technique uh, as before, so uh, when you get used to one, it's the same technique. And instead of using the juvenile chondrocytes, this is a stem cell construct, and just for time, it's the same thing. Uh, and so I'll go past that. Final uh, is migrating towards structural graphs. 
So we would love the Holy Grail to be we replace everything in a joint that has arthritis, but maybe now the whole tibial plateau certainly can be done. We get these nice osteochondral allog sorry, we get these nice meniscal allografts, and we tend to throw away the tibial plateau. But Bill Bugby and others are really taking it to the forefront and resurfacing the whole joint. So that may be in our future as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jason. And our next talk.